talk about, uh, it's actually both the difficult and, and the most interesting subject to, to speak about be, because uh, um, the, uh, the, the changes that we've had in the myeloma world over the last few years, and in fact over the 25 years that I've been working in myeloma have been extraordinary. I don't think that there is another disease in which we have had more clinical insights and, and more drug development than in, in multiple myeloma. Um, uh, I don't know that uh, we have kept up biologically. Um, we, we've managed to sort of empirically turn out a, a lot of new drugs, but I don't know how much that has um, uh, translated into to changes. So the point of this slide isn't to, 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 to say, look, look at uh, Look at all these drugs, and for everybody to to uh, to, to remember them and, and apply them to their practice or to themselves. Um, but the point is uh, that uh, we've uh, we've had a whole bunch of drugs uh, that have been approved recently. Uh, we have a whole bunch of drugs that are being studied that have been approved in other diseases, and we have an enormous list. And this is nowhere close to a complete list. Of, of drugs that are currently in clinical trials. And uh, um, uh, I have several of my research nurses and I have several of my uh, research data uh, coordinators here and they will attest to the uh, misery that this success has brought upon, uh, upon their personal lives. Um, uh, but it has been uh, extraordinary what we've uh, been able to uh, bring to the lives of our, our patients. So the, the, the subject that we get the most questions about, you know, when patients come to us, when, when I get phone calls from physicians and from, uh, from, uh, from, from patients and their family members, is about uh, immunotherapy. Uh, now, immunotherapy is a sort of difficult uh, definition. Well, what is uh, immunotherapy? Uh, well, we've been working with thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide for a number of years. There are other derivatives of thalidomide that are coming on. We call those immunomodulatory drugs. I don't have them uh, up here uh, on that list. Um, we still don't really understand how those drugs work, but they certainly change the immunologic milieu significantly. So the reality of it is that we've been doing immunotherapy and multiple myeloma for a very long time. You heard David Wiesel, not particularly eloquently, but speak about, about uh, stem cell transplant in multiple myeloma. And uh, Josh was speaking, uh, and if you think that David wasn't eloquent, Josh was even less eloquent speaking in the other room. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, about uh, autologous stem cell transplant in multiple myeloma. Well, the reality of it is the, the real big successes in, in, uh, on, uh, in aut uh, with autologous transplant in multiple myeloma are not chemotherapy successes, they're immunologic successes. And the reason that those patients do as well as they do for as long as they do is because there is some re resetting of the immunologic environment that allows the, 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 the immune system to either re-equilibrate with the disease and, and keep it at bay when it had failed previously. And the proof of that is that we have patients who don't achieve complete remissions after their stem cell transplants, yet their disease uh, remains stable for sometimes decades. Um, and uh, uh, so th that is immunotherapy. Um, but but the, the questions now are uh, about uh, the, the drugs and the strategies that are coming along. So we have monoclonal antibodies. We have a whole series of monoclonal antibodies. We've had two monoclonal antibodies approved recently. And wh what's a monoclonal antibody? Well, the, the oncologists and the other, uh, the, the other uh, uh, professionals in the room know exactly what monoclonal antibodies are. Somebody jam something into a mouse, let the mouse make antibodies, and now we've humanized them and we're using them in, in uh, human beings. Now, some of those monoclonal antibodies um, kill the cells directly. 
Um, they they uh, interact with a target on the surface of the, the cell and actually induce apoptosis in the cell. I think more typically these uh, monoclonal antibodies bind to the surface of the, the cell and attract the cells that are capable of killing things that are that are coated with antibodies. Um, we have uh, other monoclonal antibodies, checkpoint inhibitors that have become the hottest thing in oncology in general that are being applied to, to multiple myeloma, um, and they interfere with uh, pathways that are meant to dampen our immune system. So we have monoclonal antibodies that work via all kinds of, uh, of mechanisms. They fix complement, they attract cells that are capable of punching holes in the surface of cancer cells, NK cells, things like that, and they uh, attract cells that are capable of phagocytizing uh, tumor cells, and those might be the most interesting ones because those cells then present antigens from the killed cell uh, to, to our immune system and may propagate that immunologic response beyond just the, the antibody itself. So those are exciting. Then we have active ones, and Ed Statmauer uh, is uh, speaking next door right now about CAR T cells. We have had an enormous series of questions from patients about CAR T cells because there was an article about a patient who was dying from myeloma who got CAR T cell therapy actually by Ed um, and, and achieved a complete remission. Now, unfortunately, that success in that one patient wasn't that you know didn't last forever, and the overwhelming majority of patients who who got that therapy uh, don't respond as well as that that sort of index case that we're talking about. Um, but CAR T cells are very interesting uh, therapies. We can uh, we can remove your T cells, engineer uh, and a, a receptor for a target on the cancer cell of interest and have that that engineered receptor put into the T cell and, and let it activate the T cell, get it to proliferate and kill tumor cells uh, via that. The person who first developed that strategy was a guy named Zelig Escher um, who, uh, who actually just developed it as a tool in the laboratory. Uh, Carl June uh, sort of moved that into the clinical realm and it is a particularly exciting uh, strategy. Vaccines, um, there is a very large vaccine study going on in the United States in which tumor cells are fused with dendritic cells, one of the most competent types of cells in terms of pre presenting antigens to our immune system. And uh, th those dendritic cell uh, tumor cell fusions are, are then uh, given back to the patient in the hope of stimulating an immune response in the patient. And there are other strategies as well, um, including uh, uh, um, uh, all, all, all kinds of, uh, of targets. So uh, I talk to you now about, uh, uh, about the checkpoint inhibitors. So checkpoint inhibitors have been approved. They were first developed in melanoma. Sounds sort of like myeloma, but um, uh, not uh, we, half of our patients always talk about their melanoma. And, um, uh, but uh, we, we are talking about myeloma. These drugs have not been nearly as successful in, in myeloma, but it turns out that when we combine them with, uh, with image, with lenalidomide, with pomalidomide, we can take patients who are refractory to the, to the, to the pomalidomide or lenalidomide and who have no response to the checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab or nivolumumab, and when we combine them, we get excellent responses. And some of these sort of responses are quite sustained. Now, what we don't know is if there is a population of patients in which we actually get over the hump, in which we, um, uh, we uh, will educate the immune system to, to sort of propagate that response indefinitely. And uh, those are things that we're going to lose. Uh, we're going to not lose, but use. Um, Noah Baran uh, is uh, is piloting a study here uh, in which we're trying to leverage that in patients who are post-transplant. So some uh, very uh, exciting kinds of things. Um, uh, denosumab, you guys uh, use it in uh, in uh, in the uh, treatment of. Uh, uh, hypercalcemia, 
uh, it is a, a drug that has not been approved in myeloma, uh, certainly has a potential for, for, for benefit, and uh, uh, we will see other drugs in those categories used as well. Um, so uh, we started to talk about this. So we have CAR T cells that uh, look at a number of different uh, targets. So uh, again, CAR T cells, uh, m most of what they do, although th there are some variations in this, is that uh, a T cell requires two signals in order to become activated and proliferate. And in, in normal circumstance, the, the, the native T cell will engage those two targets on the surface of a cancer cell. It will start to proliferate and it will kill targets that, that have that, those paired um, antigens. Um, what what the, the current CAR T cell strategy does now is they combine both of those activating signals into a single receptor. Um, but, but they engineer the receptor by, by, by attaching a monoclonal antibody to it. So, so you have a monoclonal antibody against whatever. Um, uh, in, in, in our institution here, against BCMA, a fairly ubiquitous target on, on, uh, on B cells, but particularly plasma cells. Um, and you, 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 you form a chimeric protein. So those, those two activating signals that are normally in two separate um, receptors into one protein, and on the end of that protein, you have the antigen binding characteristic of, of the monoclonal antibody. So these cells, when they encounter a BCMA positive uh, tumor cell, they, they proliferate, and they can then kill the, the, the target cell. They are activated and proliferating and kill. So we know that it works. Um, we know that we can kill these cells. We don't know that we can cure myeloma with this kind of strategy, but we're just starting to do it. The, the cell doses that we are using right now are still relatively low. The dangers are relatively high, but this is certainly uh, uh, something that is going on. If, we can, sorry, yeah. the bite antibodies in, in myeloma? So uh, the, there, there are no bite antibodies that are actually in clinical trials yet. There are bite antibodies that are coming along and in, in have slides that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so Mills, uh, there, there's a, a, there's a, a whole uh, science, uh, one of my friends um, at, uh, at Hopkins is, uh, is particularly interested in this. We can remove tumor cells from uh, we can remove T cells from, uh, from tumor. We can expand those T cells that are specific for the cancer. Um, part of the reason that these, uh, that these cells fail is because uh, the cancers are very, very smart. They can, they can, uh, they can teach those cells to, to not proliferate and not respond. But when we grow them um, and, and can uh, engineer their environment. Sometimes we are capable of putting them back into the to the patient and having them uh, kill tumor cells. So far, this stuff hasn't been particularly successful. But most of the reason that this is not successful is because we don't really understand where all the checkpoints fall. We have drugs that we call checkpoint inhibitors, but the reality of it is, is that we are just starting to understand the environment in which these cells work most efficiently. So we, we, we will uh, uh, eventually be able to do that. Um, uh, Bob Korngold and his group here is, uh, has particular expertise in expanding T cells. We can now start to identify what are the targets that those, uh, that those T cells attack. And instead of using monoclonal antibodies that have many problems in terms of uh, you know, engineering CAR T cells, we may be able to, to cut out the, inta in the intact T cell receptor um, and put them into our, our T cells, so engineer T cells with, 
with, uh, with activating uh, molecules that are meant to be in T cells. And so th this is a very complicated uh, biology. So um, this has been done to some level with, uh, uh, with New York ESOL-1. Unfortunately, it turns out that New York ESOL-1 is also found on myocardiocytes. So in, in treating uh, patients with some of these uh, strategies, uh, there are potentially very large pitfalls like the T cells uh, actually uh, attacking, uh, att attacking the myocardium in addition to attacking the tumor cells. So um, all kinds of things. And then um, uh, uh, th th there's lots of things that we can do in the post-transplant environment. Um, engineered DLI is, is something that is, uh, that is being tried. Um, we have been collaborating with a, a company from Italy that, uh, that actually uh, allows us to, to turn the, the T cells off. We can give lots of T cells. They can kill the, the, the myeloma cells quite efficiently. But in, in, in doing so, they can also kill the patients because of uncontrolled graft-versus-host disease. Well, we, we have the ability to now engineer the cells that we give back so that when they are doing more than we would like them to do, we can actually ask them to commit suicide. So there's all kinds of interesting strategies there. I talked to you about the dendritic uh, cell fusion vaccines, interesting stuff. Um, many, many targets that are being used. One of the things that was uh, very, very exciting uh, about a year and a half ago was a report of a patient at the Mayo Clinic who got a very, very high dose of the measles vaccine. It turns out that the measles virus specifically uh, infects activated, uh, activated plasma cells, proliferative plasma cells, um, and that they gave a, an enormous dose of the uh, of the engineered virus that is used to vaccinate uh, patients against the measles, and that it specifically infects the uh, the um, uh, the the plasma cell and and actually can kill the 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 plasma cell. Now they had a success in one patient. That patient relapsed quite quickly. But just to extrapolate from another area in which this kind of work is being done, so uh, glioblastomas, uh, a cancer that we uh, have. Uh, much to uh, achieve in the future um, is is infectable by the polio virus. Um, so you can take an engineered polio virus and you can kill glioblastomas with that. Now most of the patients will have a transient response and then subsequently relapse. But you can actually give a checkpoint inhibitor to those patients and 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 get an enormous response that that ultimately uh, can can. It looks like it can cure some patients with glioblastomas. Now, admittedly, this is a very, very uh, minor population that achieves that level of response, but we are just starting to do that in, in multiple myeloma. And there's a whole bunch of companies out there that are not just working with the measles virus, but are looking at other viruses that are tropic to, to specific kinds of cancers, or engineering those viruses to make them tropic to particular kinds of cancers. And as we learn more about immunotherapy, these two fields are going to, to, to come together. So we're going to be infecting our patients with the measles virus. Um, we are then going to be turning on and off their immune uh, uh, response to those measles virus infected cancer cells. And we're going to see this kind of stuff evolve, uh, I, I hope, fairly quickly over the next decade. Um, so all kinds of things like that. Um, so uh, you know, to go through uh, the, you know, each of these things one after another, I don't know that that's really the point of this. I think the, the main point is to say that we have a lot of interesting things. Sorry, yeah. Go back on slide. The PVX on over that is, so the PVX for one of why this is more interesting in small during myeloma? Um, um, I think people feel that a lot of these uh, therapies are going to be more effective in people who have more intact immune responses. I have some, you know, sort of philosophical objection to saying we should 
be taking all myeloma patients and treating them, uh, all smoldering myeloma patients and treating them. We still don't know who are the ones who are going to progress to active myeloma and those who are not, we're still not sure that those strategies can't have a negative impact on, on either the, the likelihood of progressing or in terms of selecting for resistance when we in fact have therapies that are better therapies. So unless we are very damn sure that, uh, that we can identify those who will need treatment and that the, the treatments that we are giving them aren't going to um, hamstring us in terms of treating with more established and more effective therapies later on. I, I find it a little bit difficult to do that. I will readily admit that I am probably in the minority in, in feeling that way, um, but, uh, but I think that that uh, kind of strategy needs to be thought out very, very carefully. Um, so monoclonal antibodies in, in phase two. So uh, Implicity and Darzelex are the two that uh, are approved. We have a, a whole series of monoclonal antibodies that are, uh, that are very interesting. I can't tell you which ones I think are going to be the best ones. They are, there are a number of monoclonal antibodies with different targets, and there are now monoclonal antibodies that have been engineered to include toxins, so we can target the cells using the monoclonal antibodies. We have had great success, although not without toxicity, in using uh, a, uh, an engineered monoclonal antibody here in patients in whose disease has responded to nothing else. We have had very, very durable responses, not, not without a lot of complaints. Um, because the drugs are not as, as benign and trivial as, uh, as the, the more traditional, I guess traditional is hard to use in drug, uh, word to use in drugs that we've only been using for, for, for a short number of years. But these uh, engineered monoclonal antibodies are certainly very exciting. We have a couple of other ones that are coming online. Hopefully they'll be less toxic and more effective. Um, but I think that this is certainly a very exciting uh, way to go. And we have lots of other drugs that can sort of, um, uh, can sort of uh, leverage these as well. <laughs> All of these drugs, and um, Matt and I don't particularly get along well, but, but Matt represents Celgene, and all of these drugs work better when we use them with, with lenalidomide, when we use them with pomalidomide. Now, why that is, I certainly am not, am, am not sure, but uh, it's, it's quite remarkable that these drugs that have some efficacy become dramatically more efficacious when, when we add an imid, and we have really no idea why that should be the case. Um, so it is a very exciting world, just empirically, that uh, you know, even though we don't understand the biology, is as we mix, mix and match these drugs uh, to, to find out uh, uh, how effective they are. Just you know, Darzelex, which uh, you know became commercially available just in the last year. Um, has a response rate of about 30 percent, um, and in the real world, probably less than that. But when we use it in combination with uh, lenalidomide, the response rates double. Um, and these are in patients who are completely refractory to, to, to lenalidomide. So you know, why, why that is and what it is that makes it possible for, for that to happen is stuff that we have to understand. Why should a patient who, who, in, in whom lenalidomide does not work, um, when we use it in combination with a, an imid, um, in combination with a monoclonal antibody, you know, it's just sitting there on the surface of the cell. You know, the, it doesn't really kill the cancer directly. What is it about the imid that makes the, the cancer cell more sensitive to being killed by the monoclonal antibody or perhaps more importantly what is it that the image does to activate the the immune effector cells to to kill the, those things and if we understand that we're going to have an enormous amount of work to do in in terms of uh, of uh, uh, you know applying those insights into um, uh, to uh, 
the management of our patients. Uh, as I talked about, we have an enormous number of clinical trials that are going on in patients with smoldering myeloma. Um, we, we, as a group, argue all the time um, uh, about uh, you know what we should be doing and um, is there a, a risk of doing harm? Um, and uh, uh, you know, th there's uh, uh, th there there's a lot to to, to be done. And uh, if we could identify those patients in whom we know we're we're going to go on and actually develop symptomatic myeloma, and and apply therapies that are potentially curative, that that might be a very exciting step. I find it difficult to take a smoldering myeloma patient and say it's time to treat them and then not try to cure them. And a lot of the clinical trials I don't think have cure as their objective, but uh, have management as their objective. So it's it's a, a little bit difficult of a, of a world. But the, the point of this slide is to show you how much work is going on. Um, so the COMPASS study. So this, uh, this meeting is, is uh, sponsored by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. And, and I'm not saying this because the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation is, is here. The, I think this is the single most important study going on in the myeloma world, certainly in the United States. Um, doc, uh, the, the, their, we have a representative of Hovon here, who is uh, who is uh, is the is the Dutch uh, myeloma research consortium that uh, has done very very similar kinds of work uh, in the United States. We have never really done this, um, but but this is a clinical trial in which we have sort of uh, genetically mapped uh, all of uh, a, a thousand patients, and we are going to to see what happens to these patients as they've been treated. So we've had a lot of clinical trials in which large numbers of patients have been treated in the same fashion, and then we've been able to identify what genetic variables there are that, that, that predict for, for better or worse outcomes in response to that particular therapy. Now this trial uh, allows us to do a lot of things. It allows us to see you know, what mutations occur as patients are failed by a particular therapy. Um, it uh, uh, allows us to see you know, other pathways that are relevant in other kinds of therapies. But it also allows us to see whether for a patient with a particular genetic uh, background, is there a therapy that is better for that patient? None of the other clinical trials have actually attempted to do that. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Peter is is uh, has has brought us a uh, a, a genomic uh, a uh, gene expression profile platform that I think is is going to catch on. They're they're starting a large clinical trial here in the United States that may allow us to answer some of those questions as well. But for right now, uh, this Compass study uh, is doing things that no other study has has uh, has done before, and we're fortunate here to be participating in that study. Um, there is a, a, a new uh, a successor to that COMPASS study, so the COMPASS study does this, but this successor trial does as well. So you know, one of the big things in oncology, you've all heard of foundation medicine and things like that, that are trying to uh, to, uh, to identify uh, particular genetic signatures that are associated with better or worse response to, to particular kinds of therapies. Um, so I call this trial the son of COMPASS, um, but uh, uh, 1,600 um, uh, open reading frames that are sequenced uh, both by, by next-gen sequencing and by RNA sequencing to, uh, uh, to identify uh, potential actionable mutations, meaning uh, therapies that uh, uh, can be directed at, uh, at um, uh, patients with particular mutations. So sort of the classic one in myeloma has been a BRAF mutation. There are drugs that are used in, in other malignancies, melanoma in particular, that target that BRAF pathway. And about four or five percent of newly diagnosed myeloma patients have a BRAF mutation. Are those BRAF specific drugs going to work in those myeloma patients? But I think uh, perhaps 
you know, more importantly, we are going to see that we we're going to stop having myeloma doctors and and lymphoma doctors and and melanoma doctors. We're going to have pathway doctors. Um, that it is, that we are no longer going to be talking about uh, that that you have a a, a cancer that uh, you know that arose from from your plasma cells or pre plasma cells, um, and we treat plasma cell malignancies in this way. We are going to be saying across all malignancies that you have uh, you have uh, changes that affect this particular pathway, and and so it is going to be the pathway that we treat, and not the the, the malignancy, not the the cell type that uh, we're we're talking about. So, this so trial, I'm sorry, this trial captures the mutation, actual mutation. But that's not the yet, right? uh, But but the, the reason that the MMRF is doing this is is to help us in the management of our. Uh, but ultimately, what we're going to see is these huge, all-encompassing trials. And if we know what mutations our patients have, we're going to be able to direct patients towards clinical trials that are perhaps more applicable to to their particular genetic makeup. And uh, uh, you know, again. The place where we fail in, in doing this kind of stuff is that much of the time the reason we respond or not respond has nothing to do with the cancer itself, but sort of the background of the patient, the, the immunologic mil milieu or the, or the uh, microenvironment. I hate to, to talk about the microenvironment because the group that brought us that term and I don't see eye to eye on things, but um, the uh, the um, but but it is you know there are many host variables that we need <coughs> that we need to identify. So uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, we have lots of targets with lots of antibodies being uh, developed. Um, we're fortunate enough to be able to participate in these. We're seeing lots of combinations with monoclonal antibodies and with new drugs. Um, you know, we have done a lot of stuff with, uh, with histone deacetylase inhibitors here, and there are some new histone deacetylase inhibitors that are being looked at. But uh, the point is we have effective drugs. Now we have to figure out what is the most effective way to treat them. We have a ton of clinical trials here at the the, the John Thurr Cancer Center. Uh, I'm just showing you sort of the algorithm that we use to, to, to pick clinical trials for patients. Um, so uh, um, it, it, it is incredibly complicated um, uh, because we have been fortunate enough to have a lot of drugs uh, thrown at us uh, that we now have to figure out how to use and which ones are going to be effective. So the point isn't, you know, to to, to memorize the the JTCC algorithm, but to to understand that it's 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 difficult now to to choose uh, drugs. Um, uh, talked about CAR T cell. So the the CAR T cell study that we are doing here is uh, is is sponsored by a company named Bluebird. It is uh, it looks at uh, uh, BCMA as the as the primary target. I'm not going to detail how this is done. Um, we actually have another cellular therapy trial that is opening here um, using an engineered NK cell rather than an engineered T cell to, uh, to attack the, the, the cancer cells. So that is a very exciting thing as well. Um, uh, Isotuximab is a competitor, I guess, at some level of daratumumab, of Darcelex. So it is an interesting body. Uh, it is an interesting monoclonal antibody that seems to be slightly more active in terms of killing cells in tissue. I need to hurry up. No, no, I'm sorry. That was a good All right. Sorry. Sorry. Um, um, so uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, another monoclonal antibody targeting CD38. Um, so uh, th this is just uh, some of the data. The point is that it, it is a, another monoclonal antibody with significant activity in patients who have been heavily pretreated that, uh, uh, that uh, is now just going into clinical trials in combination. Uh, this is just, uh, again, some, some more of the data. And, and I don't know how much 
you know, the particulars of a clinical trial and the responses are, are of interest to the, to the audience, I think the point is that these things work. Pembrolizumab is uh, uh, a drug that probably most of you know from melanoma and now from a number of other malignancies. It is a checkpoint inhibitor, a monoclonal antibody against PD-1, um, and I'm not going to go through, oops, I'm not uh, going to go through all the, the details. Um, I, I actually was the, the PI on a single agent PD-1 trial. Um, there is no activity of uh, PD-1. We had uh, a couple of patients that had stable disease, um, but there were no objective responses to uh, PD-1 blockade in multiple myeloma. Um, we are now using it in a, a clinical trial in combination with, uh, with lenalidomide, um, and that trial is now expanding to, uh, to uh, include uh, carfilzomib, uh, pembrolizumib uh, combination. So that, that may be a particularly interesting combination as well. Um, certainly something that we are uh, very excited about. And uh, does this slide say anything about the response rates in, yeah. So, so the point is um, overall response rate um, uh, of 50%, uh, of but um, uh, I think that this is the interesting thing. So that in, in patients who are lenalidomide refractory, um, we, we are seeing about a third of, uh, of the, the patients respond to the combination of pembrolizumib and, uh, and lenalidomide. So I think that the idea of immune manipulations um, working is, uh, is, is going to be exciting. So we have another monoclonal antibody, this time against anti it is an anti-PDL one that is that is uh, being used, and and actually, both Peter and myself are are uh, are investigators on on this trial. Um, so uh, using this in combination with uh, pomalidomide in a number of, of different combinations, and I'm not going to go through the biology of, of uh, checkpoint inhibition. Uh, let it be said that our immune systems weren't designed to protect us from cancer. We were supposed to be dead well before we, we got cancer. Our immune systems are there to protect us against infections, and one of the the, the main evolutionary issues is to turn off the immune system once the infection has, has died down. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, cancers use that dampening of the immune system to their advantage in terms of, uh, of teaching immune effector cells to ignore them. And these new molecules, these checkpoint inhibitors, of which there are now many, um, try to circumvent that uh, part of our biology. So the, the trial that we are doing here has a number uh, of uh, arms. We are already seeing responses in patients in whom uh, the, the background uh, the therapy we would not expect to, to be effective. So, so we know that uh, 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 PD-1 blockade is effective. Now we are learning that PD-L1 blockade is effective. Um, uh, we have another target that uh, we are looking at that is particularly exciting. So um, there are many uh, proteins that are trafficked in and out of the, the nucleus, and there are pores that specifically uh, mediate that transport. Uh, in and out of the uh, of the nucleus, and uh, there's a small company up in uh, New Newton, Massachusetts, that uh, uh, has uh, developed uh, a, a series of molecules that can block that uh, transport of of proteins in and out of the nucleus. And the theory was that by blocking this, we could. Uh, we could capture tumor suppressor proteins in the nucleus and that that would then take very unstable cancer cells and tell them to commit suicide. And it looks like, the, I'm not sure that that 
mechanism is, is actually how the molecule works. It may very well be, but it actually does kill myeloma cells. And, uh, and uh, so there is now a, uh, a clinical trial going on with these. There is actually now a newer derivative that is just starting clinical trials. And we have clinical trials here with both the, the parent compound and now the, the derivative that we're both, that we're excited about uh, both of these. So. Um, uh, Andre asked uh, about bifunctional antibodies uh, that uh, um, uh, y you may have uh, started to use blintuximab uh, for the treatment of leukemia. Uh, so there are uh, antibody, there are, uh, are bispecific antibodies and there's many different ways to make bispecific antibodies. Um, so there are, are clinical trials that are in the midst of starting up with bifunctional antibodies that are specific to BCMA. And I'm just going to show you some data that, uh, that you know, in comparing in, in animal models, um, uh, CAR T cells versus bifunctional antibodies, they're indistinguishable. So, um, so the, uh, um, the, uh, hmm. It's actually easier to see in the next slide. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, in terms of the ability to the, the controls versus CAR T cells versus a bifunctional uh, antibody, so we, we may have a much much less expensive, much more uh, off the shelf way of achieving exactly what what CAR T cells can achieve using these bifunctional antibodies, and uh, and uh, th these are just uh, using. Uh, um, uh, uh, fluorescent tumor cells, you can see that the bifunctional antibody yields the same kind of protection as the CAR T cell does versus uh, the control. So, so these bifunctional antibodies are very, very exciting molecules in general in oncology and perhaps uh, uh, going to be seen uh, to be effective in myeloma in the near future. So. Um, uh, I think one of the points uh, that we, we always have to talk about is in the United States, we're incredibly bad at getting um, myeloma patients to participate in clinical trials. Um, I think I've seen clinical trials uh, published by, by Peter that, that where, where more than 90% of the eligible patients in, in, in the Netherlands participated in, a, in, in clinical trials. Um, in, in the United States, just for participating in clinical trials at all in, in myeloma, which is one of the better diseases, we, we, we get numbers that are in the single digits. Um, and, uh, and the myeloma community is a particularly well-organized community with lots of advocacy. So the, the point is that we need to start taking some of our cues from the, 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 the Europeans and how they do clinical trials and find ways to get our patients uh, to, uh, to participate. Um, so, uh, um, you know, when, when any of you guys uh, sees patients that you think uh, would benefit from the participation in clinical trials, find them. It doesn't necessarily need to be here. Um, uh, the, the, that, uh, um, uh, but but we, we need to figure out ways to, to solve the, to answer the questions and solve the problems that we have much more quickly than we do because we have so many tools now and we just are not learning fast enough how, how to use those tools. So, yeah. Is there any uh, certification, genetic or otherwise, that can predict um, a priori which, which one of these immunotherapies uh, will work better on some patients? Uh, I mean, I think that that's the, you know, the, the, the key question. And we have a little bit of data uh, about, uh, about, we were on a, a uh, a conference call yesterday about one of, about that son of that son of compass trial uh, in which one of the investigators uh, was talking about uh, one of uh, his patients that had become refractory to uh, to proteasome inhibition but had a uh, mutation that suggested that uh, the, that the clone that was operating at that moment was likely to be uh, 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 
uh, proteasome inhibitor sensitive. So they used the combination of a drug that wasn't uh, uh, approved in myeloma because of other mutations that they saw in combination with a proteasome inhibitor to, to good effect. Now, whether that answers your question, probably not. But the point is, uh, myeloma is genomically incredibly complex, and there are not uh, many themes. Um, I have treated, I think at this point, four or five patients with uh, BRAF, with MEK inhibitors. Um, I have not seen a response rate. Uh, uh, I have not seen a responder yet, although others of my colleagues have, um, you know, based on identifying BRAF mutations in my patients. Um, so the answer is uh, mostly no, but hopefully yes. Yeah. Can you comment? I mean, obviously, that's where the field is going, trying to look at these actionable items. But, uh, actionable item, but uh, we can have a lot of actionable items that are passengers and that not drivers in a disease. And what's the threshold of, of this detection of this? Because it's not just a tumor burden. Given the fact mm -hmm. that the technology to detect them is so sensitive, you can find a mutation and just reflect. From yeah, I, I mean, so we know that that there are many clones that exist in a myeloma patient from diagnosis, and they don't all have the same mutation. So the question that you're asking is a very complex one. But I think even beyond that, um, the if I, if I had a patient who had a BRAF mutation, um, I wouldn't treat them with a MEK inhibitor. I would treat them with carfilzomib. Um, I would treat them with bordezomib, because um, those are drugs that work. Um, and even though we, we haven't you know, this is the problem in myeloma is that we still don't know what are the driver mutations despite all of what we have done and it doesn't appear that there are the same driver mutations in, in all or even most patients. Um, there, there is literally no theme um, and hence uh, we direct our therapy more towards the biology of plasma cells than we do towards the, the specific mutations that the patient has. I think, you know, what the future is going to bring us is the combination of the two. It's therapies that are directed towards the biology of plasma cells in which we then superimpose the therapy that is specific for the, for the pathway that is perturbed in that particular myeloma patient. And right now we haven't gotten there and, and we, don't have the we, don't, we don't have the choices. Number one, we don't have the drugs. Uh, that that uh, that you know target those pathways that will happen, and we don't have the the choice. It's it's too complex. We we, we don't even have that information in most patients. But, but sometimes we think of those mutations as being what's going to be really the next radical change. It's probably yeah. going to be more in between. What's going to help us select among the sequence of treatment we have? What's the best sequence our, among our? American yeah, and and that's a very difficult question because we have too many drugs. But I, I think you know the the place that we're going to go is to take these very very effective therapies we have that are plasma cell directed therapies. They're not myeloma directed therapies. They they you know the, the the reason that we have the successes that we have is because we take advantage of the biology of plasma cells, and we still don't have any drugs that. That, are, that, attract, that attack the pathways that are the perturbed pathways in, in the individual patient. So we, we will start to learn that. It, it, it turns out to be way more complicated in myeloma than in virtually any other uh, cancer that, that is, uh, you know, that, that, that I know that we deal with. Um, but, but that's going to be how we end up, uh, you know, curing patients routinely is by, by combining the, the, the pathway-specific therapies with the plasma cell biology-specific therapies. What's the most um, significant factors that you look in practice to predict from a smoldering myeloma that you're going to have? It? We have something that is reliable? No. No, I mean, because it's a host phenomenon. So uh, I'm... She's not in the room, but uh, uh, people have heard me. She, she's going to actually speak uh, today. She may have spoken already. So we have a, a patient who we uh, we take care of who was 
in her early 30s when she was diagnosed. And she had smoldering myeloma, but fairly high burden smoldering myeloma that, you know, sat there perfectly fine. And uh, she was married, she hadn't had a child. And when she realized that it was, you know, three or four years into her treatment and that, and that she hadn't progressed, she said, well, you know, I've always wanted to have a child. I'm going to have a child. So she's the only patient I know who has gotten pregnant on my time. Not, I had nothing to do with the pregnancy. Um, the, uh, but the, 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 but, but she decided to get pregnant. And as soon as she got pregnant, her myeloma exploded. I mean, I, I introduced her uh, to, to Peter before. And, uh, and she went from an M spike of like 0.5 to 2.5 during the pregnancy. And as soon as she gave birth, and she was no longer immunosuppressed, um, the, the myeloma you know, took a right hand turn. So progressed, gave birth, stopped where it was, didn't go back to where it was. But, but the, the point is that what turned her from a smoldering myeloma into an active myeloma and then back to a smoldering myeloma, again, was a host thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a cancer thing. So I think the difference between the overwhelming majority of patients who have smoldering myeloma and, and those who ultimately evolve into symptomatic myeloma has relatively little to do with the cancer, but much more to do with the host. I mean, obviously, it's a combination of both of those things. Similarly, in your women, we see a lot of lymphoma while they become pregnant. You know, yeah. You know. Well, we see, we, we see, so why I tell everybody who works for me not to get pregnant, um, because it's so, da it's, I mean, you know, from an oncologic perspective, it's a dangerous environment. <laughs> Besides the fact that they then take time off and they do. 